I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning or been visiting a couple of weeks, we are having what we call... We'll start this family. morning with singing a few of the old uh, hymns of the church. We're, in fact, we're actually going to sing a few hymns of the church this morning. today was to put this live on YouTube. Usually I just record a sermon and then post it online. And today I said I'm going to go live and uh, kind of for those who watch online, just kind of let them have the, the in-person feel for a little bit. And then I pulled open YouTube just before the service started and it said, our, our terms of service have changed. You can't do that unless you have a thousand subscribers. And we don't. So anyway, I'm recording it now. So for those of you who are watching online, sorry for the delay. Anyway, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9 this morning. We were in Matthew 9 last week as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about the section right after that. And if you weren't here last week, I'll catch you up to speed while you turn, to, turn those pages to the Gospel of Matthew. And in, um, in the story we looked at last week, we saw how Jesus had called a man named Matthew or Levi to be a disciple of his. Uh, the Hebrew word for that we call disciple was Talmud, and the plural is Talmudim. And throughout our Encountering Jesus um, uh, series, if you will, I've been talking a lot about what it really means to be a disciple of a Jewish rabbi at that time, and what it means because Jesus told us to be disciples of his and to make disciples. So if we're to follow through with that, if we're to, to fulfill that mandate from Christ, we need to understand what is What's at stake? What, is, what do we have to do? What does that mean for us, and how do we go about that, considering the fact, especially, that we're not first century Jews, and we don't live in a Roman-occupied world. It's a different world, and yet, um, how do we understand the things that Jesus said within the context in which he said them, and apply it to our life and our world today to lead and guide us as we serve Christ? I, something about that um, that whole like context issue really clicked with me. Uh, last um, uh, last week, Jesus quoted something from the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea, in Matthew nine thirteen, where he says, "I want mercy, not sacrifice." Now, fortunately for us, if you have a your scripture, it probably has a little footnote next to that 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 tells you to look up Hosea six six to read that, because uh, as many tools as we have to study the scripture, as many different Bibles that we may have on our shelf or the table, 
scattered around the house, wherever they might be, we still are fairly biblically illiterate. In other words, we're not very well versed in the verses of Scripture. We don't have them nearly as familiar or memorized as Jesus or his disciples or really the very most common you know, person with the lowest education still knew their Old Testament, their Bible, a lot better than we do. And so um, it, 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 that context makes sense. When Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, they knew immediately he was talking about Hosea. He was quoting him. And they immediately would have responded in their minds by understanding the context of the times when Hosea wrote, what was going on in the life of the Israelite people, what they were up against, what their religious climate was, what the political climate was. They would have known those things from their studies, and so they would have understood it in that context. And this clicked with me. I was having a conversation with someone this week about movie quotes. And, and, and I talk about some movies from time to time. Does anyone have like a favorite movie that you just like to quote all the time, whether you realize it or not? Anybody? If I said, here's looking at you, kid, some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? If There's different quotes that if you say them, uh, people automatically know the different movies, right? And so uh, it helps if I say that, if I say a quote from a movie you know, you're automatically going to go to that movie, that scene, the characters, the storyline. If, if I were to quote something from the movie Tombstone, and you've never watched the movie Tombstone, which, by the way, I quote it a lot in everyday life, and I don't even realize it sometimes, it helps if you've seen the movie Tombstone 75 times like I have to know what I'm talking about, right? So, I, it's, I don't know, I haven't kept track. It's just a lot of times. And so, uh, if, if, if we're going there, it helps to know that context, to know exactly what the speaker was talking about. That's why it's important when you see those footnotes, those little things that refer you back to a quote from another place in Scripture that, that this author or speaker was using, it's important for you in your study of Scripture to go back to those and say, okay, what's it talking about? And then study that Scripture at least a little bit to understand what this one is talking about. All right, that's just free. I'm rambling there. I want to talk to you about what's happening next. In the three Gospels that we call the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all share um, last week's section and this week's section in the same order, and they all share them almost verbatim, and the details directly before and after those are almost verbatim. In other words, they're telling them in the same order. Now, there's sometimes that one of the gospel authors will change up an order of things to show a different emphasis. It doesn't, um, it doesn't relieve it of being truthful. That was perfectly acceptable in their thinking, the way they wrote it was perfectly acceptable to tell a story out of order to get a certain point across. It was not like anything unethical to them to do that. We would say that you're telling it wrong. If my grandparents were still alive and telling a story, and my grandmother was telling it on the rare occasion that she got, you know, she got the spotlight to share a story, she would mess up some little detail, at least according to my grandpa, and then he would say, no, 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 that's not how it happened. And he would retell it how he remembered that it happened which may or may not have been right. And she would just fold her hands and smile and be quiet and listen, and let him tell it from there on out. And he never realized that he had just stolen her story and told it maybe slightly different than she did. But at the end, it was the same story. And they were making the same point about God's provision in their life or how God had cared for them. And the gospel authors do the same thing throughout the way they tell certain events that Christ did. Now, there are some things that we think, oh, well, they must have just... Uh, gotten the details wrong. No, sometimes Jesus did almost the same thing twice. Like, he fed one time a crowd of 5,000 people with just a little bit of food, and then another time a crowd of 4,000 with just a little bit of food. And he, we know that it's not somebody getting the details wrong, because Jesus references both of those events, as if they were two separate events. But the way they're told, or how they're told, or when they're told in the Gospels sometimes is different. But in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these stories, last week's and this, happen in the same order with the same other events on either end of those. So I think there's a point in that. I don't think I'm just being some like uh, scriptural nerd here. I think there's a point. The fact is that uh, there's a continuity of what's happening here that we need to pay attention to to really get to the bottom of it. Let me read this scripture, keeping in mind that what we had looked at last week was Jesus basically, the way they viewed it, he was partying with sinners and tax collectors, the, the dirty and unclean people according to their culture and their laws. And he took a lot of flack for that. 
here in verse 14, Matthew 9, 14. We'll read three verses. Then John's disciples came to Jesus and asked, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot mourn while the bridegroom is with them, can they? For the days are coming when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, because the patch will pull away from the garment, and the tear will be worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled out, and the skins are destroyed. Instead, they put the new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Now, if you've never read any scripture, you just come to that one right there, you're like, well, what's going on? First of all, nobody sews patches on clothes anymore. You go throw them away and you buy new ones. That's how, like, that's how modern culture works. So right off the bat, we understand this is a different time than we live in, right? Like, things are different there. So we've got to dig into it a little bit and say, what are you talking about? Wedding guests? Who's mourning when the, when the groom leaves, when the, when the bridal couple's married and leaves? Nobody's mourning. Nobody, well, got to understand their celebrations lasted for a long long time and and so when the party's over it's just kind of like oh okay back to life i guess you know regular life jobs bills whatever did they have bills back then i don't know anyway i guess food you know food costs money uh anyway so the uh uh you know jesus is here he'd just been you know caught if you will partying with tax collectors and sinners and had a lot of grief over that he he had just had that discussion and now the disciples of john the baptist come up and talk to his people like john's people talk to jesus people it's a little bit like hollywood here you know nobody's talking directly to each other they're talking through their people but they come up and they say hey why do we and the pharisees fast but your disciples don't okay i got it wrong this time they were talking to jesus sorry most of the time they just go straight to his disciples so they came straight to Jesus. Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? In other words, like, why aren't you guys as religious as us, right? Like, John's a pretty good guy, and he taught us to fast, and, and the Pharisees fast, and all these other people fast. What would they would do, the Pharisees and, and John's disciples were practicing this as well. They would fast on Monday and Thursday, every week, twice a week. You remember the story where Jesus is saying, there's two guys that came to the temple to pray. One is, is, is a, a Pharisee, and one is a, is a tax collector. And the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm so good. Right? What kind of prayer is this starting out to be anyway? God, I thank you I'm so good. I mean, I do everything right. I, 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 I give a tenth of my income. I do all these great things. I fast twice a week. Oh, see? There's a detail there. Like, he fasts twice a week. That was their tradition, Monday and Thursday. And then he says, and I'm also not like this guy over here. Aren't, aren't you glad, God, that I'm not like him? And Jesus says, that other guy would, wouldn't even look to the sky, wouldn't look to heaven, beat his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He says, now which prayer do you think that God heard? Don't be mistaken. He hears the prayers that we pray audibly and in our heart. That's why I've said to people before, if you're angry with God, you might as well just tell him. I mean, try not to, like, you know, poke the cosmic deity, you know? Like, try not to, to, to poke the guy that can smote you. I think that's the word, smote. But, but, like, be honest with God. Say, God, this is how I'm feeling right now. I'm, if I'm honest, I'm angry with you. I, I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand why this is going on and why things didn't work out better. Because he knows what's in your heart, and he wants to have that conversation. He wants to know what it is that's going on with you, even though he already knows he wants you to say it because then you've invited him in to your life, into, into that conversation, and you can work through it. And in the end, he'll still be God, but at least you'll have maybe more love and respect for him in the end, no matter what is going on. But uh, this guy, the, uh, the, the disciples of John, they come to Jesus and they say, um, we fast, the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't. Now, this is a problem for them because They've seen John living, you know, John is their rabbi, he's their master, and their disciples are Talmudim of him. And they've seen him living in the wilderness, wearing stupid clothing, like just he like took the hide of a camel or a hide of something hairy and threw it on, put a, a leather belt around his waist, and, and ate bugs, okay, and wild honey. I mean, that doesn't sound so bad, but I don't think you can just eat honey. I think he's saying he lived off the land, right? John lived this 
this ascetic lifestyle, living off the land, living like, today we call it off the grid, right? Like not connected to the rest of the world. He's off the grid. And John's living out there in the wilderness, and his disciples are around him. And, and then he's, he's living, you know, as a Nazarite was the vow that is, was given to him from birth. And there, men, there were a lot of things he didn't do. You know, he didn't take a, you know, didn't cut his hair a certain way. He didn't drink alcohol. There's all the stuff that he never did. And they saw that, and they're like, oh, man, you know, here's, um, here's the way we were taught to live by John. And then here's Jesus, the one that John had pointed to, to and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's out here partying with sinners and tax collectors and all these people. On top of that, they don't fast like the tradition of the Pharisees. So they said, what's going on with that? Now, there are, there are lots of times that Jesus will kind of get into this clash with people over different things um, that he didn't play by their rules. You know, another time it's, it's hand washing. The Pharisees say, you know, well, we, we practice this certain ritual, the way we wash our hands, the way we wash bowls and cups and things. And you don't do that. And your disciples don't do that. But you know what Jesus was never accused of in all of his ministry and all the, the teaching and, and ministry and living that Jesus did? You know the things he was never accused of? Things like murder, adultery, theft, greed, uh, you know, idolatry, slander. Jesus never did those things. They couldn't accuse him of any breaking any of the commandments. They couldn't accuse him of transgressing the written law of God that Moses had handed down to them. The, Jesus had never done those things. The only thing that they could ever accuse him of was breaking their written or their uh, oral tradition. They eventually wrote it down around the second century. Um, that was called the Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D. And the Talmud was their, their spoken interpretation of the laws. And I've talked about this before. For instance, you know, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I was always taught that just meant, well, we go to church and we don't work in between morning church and night church, which we don't even have night church in most churches anymore. So uh, it just means go to go to church and then don't do anything the rest of the day. I'm simplifying it. I'm almost mocking that. I'm, I don't mean to, but I'm just saying like that was the simplification of it. That was what it meant to honor the Sabbath day. Well, there's got to be more to it than that. Why did what else did God mean by that? So then we would start talking, well, what are some other things you can't do? What are some things you can do? And we, we start listing them all out in this oral tradition, if you will. It's not one of the commandments directly. It's how to live out that commandment. It's the interpretation of that commandment. And so um, that, was, that became a tradition that they would hand down from generation to generation. And eventually the accepted um, versions of that were the, the, the Talmud, the written oral tradition. So Jesus responds to this charge by them about not keeping their tradition of fasting by talking about weddings and bridegrooms and, and, and when the groom is gone, then you can fast. Or in other words, when, when the bridegroom leaves, the party's over, and then you can go back to your rituals and your mourning and fasting and whatever you feel like you need to be doing. But while the groom is with you, you party and you celebrate. In other words, while Jesus was walking this earth, enjoy it while he's here because a time's going to come when he's not physically on this earth anymore. And that's a time to start you know, start up the religious machine, so to speak, although that's not what he was saying. Uh, he was saying, you know, right now, they don't need to fast. They're with, they're with me. I'm, I'm, I am their source of life. I'm what's giving them life. Jesus then continues to talk in the next verse about uh, garments, you know, sewing a patch on a piece of old cloth, you know, a, a new, new cloth on old cloth. It's going to, you know, it hasn't shrunk yet. It's going to rip apart the garment you're trying to save. That's no good. He says, then you, if you pour new wine into an old wine skin, you know, they would have like sheep hide or, or, or sometimes uh, different organs, you know, like a stomach or something. They would take that and they could use those for vessels to hold water or liquids. And if you pour new wine that hadn't fully fermented yet, it would expand and it could cause that wine skin to, to burst. And then you lose your wine, you lose your wine skin. So... What he was saying was, if you're going to make new wine, you got to use a new wine skin so that it can, as it expands and the gases of fermentation expand, it can expand with it. What's Jesus talking about here? I think part of it is that he's talking about a complete renewal and a full restoration of, um, of who we are as human beings. And I'll get to what I mean by that in a second and how that ties in. What he's saying is, you can't just take 
the things that I'm teaching you, you can't just take the, the way of life that I'm giving you and just slap it on your old religious system and expect it to work. I picture the guy, have you seen the commercial, like the Flex Seal guy? You know, first they had the sprays on stuff, and now they got that patch that you can slap on there. He's got this huge water tank, and there's a hole in it, and he just slaps it on there, and it stops leaking magically, right? Or Flex Seal magic, I don't know. Anyway, um, he, that's, you know, that's the commercial. That's what he claims works. I haven't poked a hole in a big water tank to see if that'll work yet or not. I've just, I don't know. Anyway. Um, I had somebody want me to work on their gutters this week, said they're leaking at the seams, but she's got that tape stuff you put on them. I said, how about I just get some of the old fashioned gutter caulk that's made specifically for that and we'll do it that way. So um, you can't just slap that, that, that new, that, the teachings of Jesus on your, on your old life and on your old systems and expect it to change. What he was saying was, I am bringing you new wine. The, the, the things that Jesus was saying, the things that Jesus was doing, the teaching that he was bringing and the salvation that he was going to eventually um, bring by his death on the cross and his resurrection is the new wine that, that would take a minute to ferment. It would take a minute for it to come to fruition. And at the time when the Holy Spirit showed up on the day of Pentecost and, and the people were uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit and given the power of the Spirit, that that, that was the, the full fermentation of the teaching and the life and ministry of Jesus. That was the fullness of his kingdom. And that you can't just overlay that on top of all of your oral traditions that you have, all of your old religious ways that you have. Now, Jesus said, I didn't come to undo the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. He never said, I came to uphold your oral traditions. In other words, your religious traditions. He came to uphold the law of God and to be the fulfillment of it. And so he's saying, you can't take uh, me and my life and my ways and put them over your old traditions. It doesn't work that way. Over and over and over again, Jesus would bump into the, especially the Pharisees about things like this. In John chapter 3, he's talking with the man named Nicodemus, and he was a Pharisee, and he had come to Jesus at night and wanted to understand a little bit more about what Jesus was saying and doing. And, and as, as he's talking with Jesus, Nicodemus doesn't seem to be understanding it, and Jesus says, I came, you know, what I want you to do is have new birth, new life. He says you have to be born from above. Amen. And it's the same word that means again as well. So Nicodemus thought be born a second time. And Jesus said, no, you have to be born from above. This is what I was talking about, about what Jesus came to do is a full, uh, complete restoration or renewal. We're being renewed in the image of Christ. You see, back in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, we were created in God's image. And then a couple chapters later, we decided to do things our way, and we sinned against God. And so now we're um, kind of living for ourselves, living for our own image, if you will. And God has been working ever since then to restore us to the image of God. That's what Christ brings, is full restoration. And so when he's having this conversation with Nicodemus about these things, he says, you have to be born from above. You have to be born a second time, but it's a birth from above. It's a spiritual rebirth. And so when Jesus talks to us about how to live life, about new patches on old garments and new wine and old wineskins and all these things, what he's really saying is it, it matters what you're trying to um, what you're trying to do with putting him into our old systems. It won't fit. You can't just take a little bit of Jesus and try to, to fit him into your life. He's the entirety of your life. Your, your vessel, your container has to be designed for him. In other words, you can't just clear out a little space in a closet and say, okay, Jesus, this is your spot. Okay, Jesus, this old wine skin is good enough for what you're trying to pour into me. No, you have to be completely born from above to be ready for Christ. Jesus would um, um, reframe their religious uh, traditions over and over again. And by reframe, what I mean is he would change their thinking. For instance, on this one, they're talking about fasting, and he puts it in a, a new way to view it or a new way to look at it. He would do this several other times with different things. Um, and for instance, with fasting, the Bible only commanded one particular fast for the people of Israel to do, and that was once per year. There were other fasts that were suggested, but they were commanded once per year to fast, not twice a week. That was that oral tradition. There's many other things Jesus did this with. For instance, um, he talked about uh, murder. You've been told not to murder, right? That's one of the commandments. 
but he reframed it by saying, don't even say something that's, that's hateful towards another person. You know, if you, if you even call your brother so much as calling him a fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Now, that was pretty radical for his day and even for ours. I mean, you would have a, lot, uh, a hard time if you tried to go on the Internet and police that today, all the time somebody said something hateful. I'm not talking shared a dis different opinion or agreement. I'm saying the times that people just flat out said something that, that, that was, you know, hateful or, you know, more than rude to a stranger even. Man, Jesus said, if you say something hateful like that, you have murder in your heart. He says, adultery, you know, there's a command against that. Don't do it. But I tell you what, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, you've done the same thing already in your heart as, you, as if you had done it physically. He reframed their understanding of the law. Theft? What if somebody wants to, to sue you and take your, your tunic or your coat? Give them your tunic as well. You know, if they want to take a little bit from you, just give them a lot. Why? Aren't we going to go broke if we do that, Jesus? How can we afford to do that? Well, first of all, there's a scripture that says, as much as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So start there. Don't ever give anyone a reason to sue you. But uh, if it does happen for some reason, then say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to go broke over this, but Jesus commands me to do it. I don't know how to live that out if it comes knocking on your door, by the way. I'm not trying to say, hey, everybody needs to go broke. I'm just saying I wrestle with that because Jesus reframed what it means to be generous, even when people are trying to take you for everything you've got. The Sabbath, what did he say? More, more times than almost anything, this comes up. Jesus healing someone on the Sabbath, telling them to carry their mat that they've been paralyzed on on the Sabbath. And so he gets in trouble for, for healing several different people on the Sabbath or for his disciples picking heads of grain and rubbing the chaff off of them and eating the heads of grain. And, and he gets in trouble for this more times than anything. And I say in trouble, I mean people like start hollering at him about it. And he, he reframes what it really means to observe the Sabbath by doing the things which preserve and restore life. So if you have something recreational that helps to restore you to sanity or, 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 or physical peace of some kind or strength or wholeness, and the Sabbath is the day you get to do that, then by all means do it. If it is honoring to God and restores life, then that is a proper Sabbath day observance. You don't need a further rule than that. What about taxes? He reframed this one. Should we pay taxes to Rome? Should we give money to the government that's evil and trying to, 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 to hem us in and kill us and keep us from practicing our religion? Which we, we tend to think in our day that they're doing that just as much as they did in Jesus' day. And the truth of the matter is Rome had given the Israelites a, a free pass pretty much to, to live their religion. In fact, they didn't even pay taxes directly to Rome. They paid taxes to the tax collector who was collected locally to like the Herods, and they would they would receive the taxes to govern their land. Now they might have sent a portion of it to Rome, but basically in their region, Rome had just allowed the taxes to stay there locally. And so a lot of building projects went into place. A lot, you know, Herod, especially Herod the Great, uh, he was a huge builder of magnificent buildings. They took years, including the temple that Jesus and the disciples worshipped at. That was built by essentially by their tax dollars. I don't know if that makes it good or bad or right or wrong, but Jesus reframed the discussion on even paying taxes to say, well, if Caesar's image is on the coins, if, if a picture of one of your rulers or presidents is on the dollar bill, then render unto them what belongs to them. And if you don't like it, vote different in the next election. And then if, if, if you're stamped with the image of something on your life, then you should render that unto God. And he was going back, of course, to Genesis, where we were created in God's image. He says, whose image is on the coin? Okay, if it's Caesar's image, I guess it's Caesar's money. You're stamped with God's image. You belong to God. You see, Jesus would reframe these discussions or these, these things. Um, the, the one just before this about him partying, so to speak, with, uh, you know, going to a banquet, if you will, with sinners, with, with tax collectors, with people that were hated. Uh, he says, look, you know what? Um, the kingdom of heaven is open to people such as this. When he went to Zacchaeus' house, I talked about Zacchaeus last week. When he went to Zacchaeus' house, um, Zacchaeus uh, had been struggling with his own identity. Um, it doesn't say that. I just read into the text because Jesus says, 
Today, after Zacchaeus had repented and offered restitution, he says, this man is a child of Abraham. In other words, he's restored back to the people of Israel, if you can accept that. There were many who couldn't accept that. But Jesus was basically saying, if you want to accuse me of partying, of being a drunkard and a glutton, as they accused him of that, what I'm doing, Jesus would have said, what I'm doing is welcoming people back into God's kingdom. So if you can honor God, go to a party, and bring people into God's kingdom, then you should be doing those things. What about almsgiving, you know, charity to the poor? What about fasting? What about praying? Jesus said if you're going to do those things, he didn't say they were bad. But he says if you're going to do them, don't do it because there's a rule. I'll say it this way. If you're going to give to the local church, to a, a charity, to an organization that's helping those in our town, whatever it might be, don't give just because there's a number like 10% or something like that that you believe God has said to do. If you're going to give, give because God has commanded you to be generous, because he's a generous God, because he's given lavishly to you for your life and for your well-being that you want to share that with others. Giving to the poor, fasting, praying, he said these things, don't do this because there is some rule or stipulation about it. Do it because it's between you and God. Because when you realize it's between you and God, it's a conviction that you have that God has given you, and you should be following that and living for that. See, Jesus came to give us a full new birth. He came to, to, to restore us in the image of Christ. And the rules that we as humans have made up are supposed to be helpful. They're supposed to be something that can guide us, but they're not made to be a cage that imprisons us. They're not made to be shackles that bind us to a certain religious way of life. They're made to be just beacons and guideposts that can point us to the full life that Christ has offered us with this new life that he gives, the new wine that he is making. The, the Church of the Nazarene has what we call a manual. That sounds about as boring as it gets, right? I mean, like we couldn't have come up with a better name for our governing, governing policies and document. But um, there's a lot of stuff in there that just says, here's, if we are a global church, a global denomination, here's how you can live that. Here's how you can be that church and do those things. There's one section in there that's called the Code of, of Christian Conduct or something like that, or Covenant of Christian Conduct, sorry, Covenant. And it's, it's basically um, addresses many different religious topics or Christian topics and says, how do you live these things out? How do we as the Church of the Nazarene understand what it means to be a Christian and fulfill these commands of God? And I'll be honest, there's some that I think don't really, um, I don't know, don't really quite jive. And you know what? I can still teach it, and I can still be a Nazarene and still agree with most of it and not agree 100%. We're the same way with whoever you voted for in the last election. I bet you didn't agree with 100% of what they stand for. And if you did, mm, I don't know. I can't see 100% on either side of things here. You know what I mean? So it's like, okay. Um, but, but, and also, by the way, if, you, if you're an old school Nazarene and you're like, oh, no, he can't say that. Well, why do we have a general assembly every four years? They're always discussing the things in the manual that need to change. So um, it's a reactionary document to what we're saying and believing and understanding from the local church on up. But I said all that to say this, that, that book, that document is supposed to be a guideline for how do you live this Christian life the way we understand it, the way we interpret it. But I think in whether it's that discussion, whether it's politics, whether it's your own personal life, Look at the things that you have held on to as this is just what I do. This is how I live. These are the, the sacred traditions that I follow. Are those the kind of new wine that Jesus was pouring? Are those the, the, the kind of interpretations that Jesus was talking about? Or are those things that we've just kind of added up and adopted over time and it becomes our version of the town, our version of the oral law? And when we come up to Jesus and we see him not living that out, we see him not living the way we're living. In essence, we have our religious rules, much like the disciples of John, and we say, hey, Jesus, why don't you live the way that we live? You've got to realize there's times where we've thought we were better than Jesus. Right? I mean, haven't we? We said, oh, Jesus, I, um, you know, I'm really good. I, I tithe. I give a 10% of everything. And Jesus is, yeah, I saw some wealthy people doing that in the temple. And then there was a widow who gave two copper coins, and it was all she had to live on. She gave 100%. Whoa. All of a sudden, I thought my religion was pretty good for giving 10%, and Jesus is saying, 
She gave everything. She trusted in God with all she had. And you trusted me with a tenth of it? Whoa. Don't you trust me more than that? Don't you trust me to bless you more than that? You see, there are times where we sometimes, whether we acknowledge it or not, we believe we know more than Jesus. Until we come face to face with him in the scripture, and he kind of gently smacks us upside the head and says, new wine, new skins. You can't just take my life and my teachings and slap it over your traditions and your uh, rules that you've lived by. You have to be an open vessel that's allowing Jesus to fill you, to completely, uh, to shape you and to fill you and to make you into who he wants you to be. Here's the simplest rule for how to live as a, as a Christian. If there's anything, anything that you can do that doesn't break a commandment of God and, and also can draw someone to Christ, that's permissible. If there's anything that you do that breaks a commandment or law of God and pushes someone further away from Christ, don't do that. I will say there's an exception. There are some people that are so adamantly opposed to anything to do with God or Jesus Christ that it doesn't matter what you do, it might push them away because of their own biases that they have. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the things the Apostle Paul said about uh, if you do something that, 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 out of, you know, that isn't acting in love towards someone that can cause them to stumble, don't do those things. This isn't a sermon necessarily about liberty in Christ, although we do have it. It's about having the right skin, pouring new wine into new skins. As Pastor Kendall comes up, I'll just close with this. He's called us all to be vessels that are carrying his life, his teaching, his ministry, his forgiveness, and his restoration to the world around us. Are you a vessel that's open to carrying the gospel of Christ completely and fully to the people in this world that need to hear it so much? Thanks for watching and being part of this. I hope you've liked and subscribed on YouTube and Facebook for the latest updates. If you haven't, what are you waiting for? Anyway, go ahead to our website and do that now. You can find the links there. And also, we'd appreciate uh, every gift that you give to support the work and ministry of our church within this community. If you haven't been giving faithfully through one of these methods here on the screen, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and go to our website now and you can find ways to give through this local church to help our community reach uh, those who are in it for Jesus Christ. You can also go on our website and find a connect card that you can fill out. And on that, you can give us um, the, the information that, about you and where we can connect with you and get in touch with you and keep you up to date with our prayer chains and things like that. Go on our website for that. And also to find the link to Right Now Media, where you can have your own login that we have provided for you on that and you can watch a bunch of christian content if you haven't done it already what are you waiting for go ahead and do that right now thanks for being part of this encountering jesus series we pray that it's been beneficial to your life and to your walk with jesus christ thanks you guys love you bye